With warming seas creating new opportunities at the top of the world, nations are scrambling for a piece of the Arctic. Hello, I'm Nathan King, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Below the ice and cold waters of the Arctic Ocean, there are hidden vast natural resources. About 20% of global oil supplies, 30% of the planet's natural gas and perhaps deposits of platinum, gold, tin and more. Global climate change and warming oceans bring the potential for a bounty of opportunities and natural resources. Which is why the United States, Canada, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Russia and Denmark have all staked claims to the region. Later, we'll talk with representatives from three of those countries. But first, the opening of the Arctic is also a potential economic boon for companies. But with reward, of course, comes risk. And as CCTV's Sean Caleb's reports, there are concerns that more shipping traffic could lead to a disaster. As ice retreats, more Arctic waters are open for navigation. And that means vessels such as the Umiak-1, a Canadian bulk container ship owned by the Fednop Shipping Company, will be making more trips into frozen regions. This ship is a polar class four icebreaker, as powerful as any non-nuclear icebreaker in the world, according to Captain Mike Lee. This ship is made to first cut the ice and then kind of lift the weight of the ship onto the ice and just continuously break it. On this trip, the Umiak is going from Quebec to a copper mine in northern Labrador to load ore. But where the Umiak really makes its money is in the worst of the worst conditions. And a normal vessel would either um, be uh, holed or it would uh, break propellers, break rudders. Uh, they, it's impossible to do it. It's estimated the Arctic holds roughly 25 percent of the remaining natural resources in the world. It's no secret the Northwest Passage, connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, is opening, luring more and more ships into treacherous waters. Some have even labeled the Northwest Passage Panama Canal North, meaning container ships, cruise ships, and other vessels are finding the icy water more appealing to trim time and money off their trips. But many in the industry say that's a bad idea. For a ship, for instance, to load in New York, and go to Shanghai via the Northwest Passage, no. I don't believe that that will ever be economical, certainly in the next 40, 50 years. Tom Patterson decides where Fednop ships, like the Umiak, can and cannot go in Arctic waters. The Umiak is a massive vessel operating with 30,000 horsepower. That is three times as powerful as most bulk container ships its size. Built for $90 million, it also cost three times as much as a traditional ship. So as you can imagine, the Umiak has the very latest high-tech wizardry to avoid damaging ice. It will tell us here on the ship what kind of ice concentrations, ice types we can expect along our route. Uh, and then we can, with that information, we can maybe deviate into easier ice regimes to avoid the, the bad stuff. We've been spending many, many months and years and, uh, and money developing the technology. The technology today exists to take oil and gas out of the Arctic. It exists to operate all year round, and it will require very specialized, expensive tonnage to operate in the winter time. Even with the array of high-tech equipment like radar, people on the bridge still keep eyes on the water because this is what they run into even in the summer, icebergs that come down from the north and when they break up the little bits are called bergy bits and the even smaller portions are called growlers and those things can simply devastate the whole of your average cargo ship. A year ago Fednuff became the first ship to sail unescorted through the Northwest Passage but the company points out it was a heavy-duty bulk container ship and Patterson for one is concerned that lesser vessels and cruise ships may tempt fate in the Northwest Passage causing a bad accident or spill. In the Arctic is, is a very pristine environment, and the people who live there depend on us to give them the best set of ships. 
we must mitigate the risk because that environment cannot be disturbed. Sean Cadlebs, CCTV, aboard the Umiak One. Fascinating stuff, and Sean will be with us here in the studio later in the program. But for more on the competition for Arctic riches, we are joined now by Eric Vilstrup Lorenzen. He's the Arctic ambassador of the Kingdom of Denmark and Danish Under Secretary of State for Arctic Affairs. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. You know, the Arctic has been really in focus in the last few months for several reasons, but it's been called the next global battleground for resources and access. Would you agree with that, Ambassador? No, I would, I would say the Arctic is, is definitely uh, the, uh, uh, the, the interest for the Arctic has risen. That is true for, for a while. And, um, and it's, but it's important to say that it's, uh, right now it's a low tension area and it's important to, uh, to keep the Arctic uh, a low tension area. But part of the interest is, of course, as you say, the interest uh, for uh, natural uh, resources that we know that are there. Uh, but it's not a battleground. Uh, actually, most of the resources that we know are there in the Arctic. They are within the boundaries of, uh, of, of, of the states, of the Arctic states. Uh, so that's important. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, cooperation going on on that. And that's, of course, um, important to not have it as a battleground, but to keep it as basis for international cooperation, which, which, which works right now, actually. So you say it's not a battleground, but there are competing claims when it comes to territory up there. The Kingdom of Denmark has claimed 100 and uh, 895,000 square kilometers uh, of the Arctic Ocean, including the North Pole, 20 times the size uh, of Denmark. Can you explain uh, why your claim is so seemingly large? The, the, the work uh, for, for that, that went ahead before, before the claim is actually very science-based. It, it's, it's something that's been going on since 2002. And it's done in, in, in very good cooperation with, with other Arctic states, including Russia, Canada, and, uh, and others. So it's, it's science-based for many years that's shown that uh, the claims that, that, that we have made, uh, we think, are, are, are valid. It's science that based that the continental shelf extends beyond the 200 nautical miles, and that we have solid base, and that's why uh, the claim has, has the size it, it has. Uh, it's not 200 uh, nautical miles from Denmark, though. It's from uh, the autonomous region of Greenland, correct? Yes. And, uh, but when we talk about uh, the continental shelf, that's why we're also talking about the Kingdom of, of, of Denmark, because the construction is that uh, the Kingdom of Denmark is uh, Denmark, Greenland, and the Faroe Islands. And then when it comes to, uh, to these issues, uh, as a, 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 a part of our constitution, we're doing it, uh, we're doing it, uh, it together. So that's why we're saying that it's, it's the Kingdom of, uh, of Denmark. That's right. Of course, uh, Greenland, part of uh, the Denmark Kingdom uh, for a long time. But you say these claims are scientific, but of course, the Russians say the same thing about their claims. Canada says the same things about their claims, the US too. And yet, a lot of them are overlapping. Yeah. I, I think it's, it, it's important to, uh, to, to note also, so the work that's been going on in, in all these uh, Arctic states, that's uh, work that we've all uh, known about. It's a quite transparent uh, process. Uh, we, we share information on, uh, on that. And, and the main point on this is that we all do this work on the same basis. That's the UN Convention of the Law of the mm. Sea. That's the basis for our work. All agree to that. So when we submit our different claims, we all do it within the same process. We all agree it should be the UN Convention. It's, the, it's, it's that commission that will look at the data. And when that is done, and they will come up with the results, it's true there may be what we call overlapping claims, so that some of the area uh, can be claimed both by Russia, by Canada, and by the Kingdom of Denmark. And by then, we will have to negotiate bilaterally how to find a solution. But just to say also, we actually have some experience in the Arctic on that. Norway and Russia have made an, an agreement in the Barents Sea, and we ourselves negotiated with Canada an agreement in the Lincoln Sea in 2012. So, so the experience that we have so far uh, and which we, we, which we expect to continue. That is uh, actually solid cooperation because everyone has an interest in that. Well, this all sounds very happy and, uh, and people uh, negotiating in good faith, but uh, the rest of the world looks at the Arctic and gets very worried very quickly. Uh, they're known to be large deposits of oil and gas up there. We know that uh, climate change is happening. Uh, couldn't these claims exacerbate a sort of scramble uh, for the Arctic going forward with global consequences? 
Yeah, but it's, it's, it's not a real uh, contradiction. We know the resources uh, are there and we, we, we must have, of course, a sustainable economic uh, development that takes into account uh, uh, the environment. And that's also why we, in parallel to, to what the work that's going on in the Arctic, we, uh, we have a solid politics on, on climate in, in Paris and, and very much hope that we can uh, reduce the, uh, the CO2 uh, gases and, and have uh, more greenhouse gases. So, so the work that's going on in Paris is, is very, very important and we work together with the same, uh, with the same states as also doing in, in the Arctic. But, but uh, so far there's no, it, it's not that it will explode with, with resources. We know it's there. It will definitely take some time before it's, uh, it's ready to extract to its full extent. Uh, but it's important to, uh, to have that. And we don't, we don't see that necessarily a big contradiction uh, with the climate. So, so just to be clear, you think that there can be drilling in the Arctic, extracting of natural resources and still meet global climate change commitments? Yes, we, 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 but it, of course, uh, it, it, it's very, very important that all the, 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 the drilling and, uh, and things that, that, uh, that, may, uh, that may take place uh, is done uh, sustainable so that you still uh, live up to all the, all, all, the, all the goals that we will have uh, on, on climate change and we will work to in, in Paris. So it's not that everything will just uh, uh, go ahead without, without taking note of the policy that we committed ourselves to. So uh, they, they must be, the, the work on climate change must be very clearly linked to, uh, to what we're doing in the Arctic. I just want to go back to the strategic uh, point of view because Russia is probably one of the largest Arctic nations, Canada also uh, competing. Uh, sorry to use the phrase Cold War when it comes to the Arctic, but some have suggested that the Kingdom of Denmark being a member of NATO is kind of the US proxy uh, in the Arctic Council, uh, that Canada has, has uh, uh, obviously problems with the US, that Russia has problems with the US. Could this exacerbate global tensions? We, we, I, I think it, it's it, what we are trying to, and and and, and it seems to, uh, definitely to work. That is to keep, in spite in spite of, of of what's going on also in Ukraine, we're trying to to continue to have the Arctic as a low tension area. It's been for a while, and we we work quite hard to uh, to keep it that to to keep open the dialogue and and work hard on that. I just but I just came back from Moscow this week actually, and 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 going to to Washington where we will discuss to give you one example on Arctic high sea fisheries. Russia will be at the table together with the U.S. We'll, we'll negotiate that next week. So it's important to have these concrete examples of good cooperation uh, at, at the same time. But there is militarization of Arctic bases going on. Uh, the Russians have reopened some that were closed during the Cold War. The U.S. has plans to have missile defense ramped up uh, in the Arctic as well. Is there a danger that as the great powers focus more on the Arctic, we could see a militarization? Uh, we, 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 we are, of course, very aware of, of that, but I think we, we all are, and, 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 and we will also, in, in the spring, look to, to our capacities. But it's, it's also important to say that some of the capacities, they are, look, they are used for surveillance on uh, oil spill, they are used for, uh, for, for, to, to keep an eye on, on, on climate and, and, and other issues. So it's important to have a good cooperation. And one example where we're all aware of we need information sharing Last month, there was an agreement on the uh, on cooperation with what's called the Coast Guard Forum. Mm. So all of the Arctic states in the Arctic Council agreed to share information on uh, uh, traffic for shipping up there. So to keep that information an open channel, that's very important to avoid that situation. Uh, I'm glad you'd mentioned the Coast Guard because Coast Guard's very important for, for shipping too. And one of the consequences of climate change is that the Northwest Passage and other areas in the Arctic come open for shipping, uh, sometimes for half of the year now. That means it's an interest not just for Arctic claimants, but big shipping uh, countries like China, for example, that exports and imports a lot. Uh, that is going to be a major seaway going forward, correct? And what are you doing about it? it uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and, uh, and I think we, we're fully aware that, that, that countries, uh, states like, like China, Japan, South Korea, they have legitimate interest in, in shipping. It's international waters. And eventually, uh, when it's possible, they will be there. So that's why we, for instance, um, uh, argued that we thought it was a good idea to have China as an observer in Arctic Council. Mm. We'll work with them in IMO because it's important to engage with those states before you have the real traffic there. For now, 
it's important to say also, if you compare with the Suez uh, Canal and the traffic there, it's very, very limited. But we need to work on rules, on, on, on safety before we have that situation. But that doesn't mean that only the Arctic states will work. We will when it comes to sovereignty. When it comes to shipping, environment, climate, it's very important to open up to others. That's why we think China is an important uh, partner in the Arctic. I've been there myself, and they will. Uh, we have argued that they should uh, be a member uh, or observe in the Arctic Council, and there we will also have uh, cooperation with them, and we have it already. So yes, it's important to engage with China. Uh, Ambassador uh, Vilstrup, uh, Lorenzen, uh, thank you so much for joining us from Copenhagen. Coming up, the view from the other nations who stake a claim in the cold, frozen north, and why. Stay with us. You're watching the heat.